welcome you again to our service here in the Christian Independent Methodist Church. We're in a rather dusty building recording this because the workmen have been working here. And so if we're drinking water or coughing a bit, don't get too annoyed or concerned. But we do pray again that you are knowing God's help and God's blessing in these difficult days. And we do remember those that aren't well and those that we know that are in hospital at present. Our Thursday night Bible study will be taken uh, this Thursday evening by our lay preacher, Mr. Stuart Brown. There is also the drive-in service for the Dungannon Church is running, and this time it will be a farewell service also for Gemma Maxwell, who is planning in the near future and going to the mission field. There will be the farewell in Dungannon this Sunday, and then next Sunday in the Mockerfeld drive-in. All those details you'll get on the church's websites regarding times and so on. Uh, let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we bow again in your presence today, and we thank you that the Lord knoweth the way that we take. We thank you that as we come before you today to know that you're the shepherd and that we are the sheep of your pasture. To know, Lord, that whenever you put your sheep forth, you go before them, and you make the crooked places straight. And we'd ask of you, dear Father, that you will bless us again today, and with Jabies of old, we'd ask of you that you might enlarge our capacity for God, and that your hand would be upon us, and that you would preserve us from evil. Our Father, we pray for our congregation this morning. We remember all the young people. We pray for the children and for the youth. We ask you, dear Father, that your blessing will be upon the homes and the families. And even during this time of lockdown, that each family might know your grace that you've promised is all sufficient. We know there are those, Lord, who are trying to homeschool children. and Maybe they find it difficult. I pray for them that you will help them. Pray for those today that are sick, that you will draw near to them. For those, Father, that are known to us, who have been diagnosed with cancer this week, I pray that you will bless them. And may they be conscious of the peace of God who passeth that passeth all understanding. We thank you that the Lord is good. You are a stronghold in the day of trouble, and you know all them that trust in you. We continue to pray for those who have the rule over us, and you have commanded us to do this, Lord. And I just pray for them that you might give wisdom and guidance and discernment. Grant our Father that you will visit us again with the move of your spirit that even in this land of ours that we might see the hand of god at work we remember those father who are preaching your word over the air today pray that you'll encourage them pray for those that are listening that are unconverted that they might realize that the lord jesus is coming back again and it's time to prepare to meet god we remember too, Father, this morning, Gemma, as she prepares for the mission field. Pray that you'll be with her and with her family. Grant this step by step as she goes that the way might open up before her. Continue to, to remember, Father, the situation even in our land with regard to this virus. And we ask of you, Lord, that you will bless those that are working even this day in difficult circumstances. We would pray, Father, that even in the midst of a sickness, that you will speak and that your plans will be fulfilled in all of our lives. Bless the reading and the preaching of your word to all of our hearts today. In the Saviour's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is a very familiar portion of scripture 
from the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah and chapter 18. And we're reading from verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there will I cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as same good to the potter, to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. And we know that God will bless to us this morning again the reading from his precious inspired word. Recently in our church gazette that came out a week ago, I wrote an article for it entitled, It's Time to Let Go. I must say that over the 20 or 21 years that we have been publishing the gazette here for the local church, that I don't think ever I've had as much response to a message. I covered in that message as to how there are circumstances and how there are relationships that we have to let go of. One person that contacted me, someone that doesn't belong to our fellowship here, they mentioned to me the great blessing and the challenge that the message had been. And with their email, they quoted this passage of scripture that I've just read. This passage had been on my mind to preach on this morning, but I think that confirmed it to me that I ought to look afresh at the potter's house. And so this morning, I want to entitle this very simple message as the potter's house. Perhaps maybe we will recall and we can meditate upon the fact of the potter and the clay and how the the potter is constantly at work in all of our lives. God used many images to describe his relationship to his people. He reminds us that he is the shepherd and we are the sheep of his pasture. In John chapter 15, where John reminds us that Christ is the true vine and that we are the branches. We know there are other times whenever the Word of God describes our relationship uh, between father and son that we can have a relationship with our heavenly father. We know that the terminology is used of the husband and wife relationship, but we know that all of these different verses of Scripture displays for us and teaches us so many valuable lessons, lessons about ourselves, lessons about life, and lessons also about our Lord and Saviour. There are four writers in the Scriptures that mention the potter and the clay. We have read here in these few verses from the prophecy of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the man that is known as the weeping prophet. Jeremiah speaks about the potter and the clay. We know that there was Isaiah And he refers to it, and we all know Isaiah as the prophet of God, the man who was given a vision of the holiness of God. There was the prophet Zechariah that refers to the potter and the clay, the prophet Zechariah who wrote so plainly about the crucified Lord and Saviour. And then over in the New Testament, there is 
the man who wrote so much of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, and he speaks so plainly about the grace of God that has appeared to us. And I want to say, dear friends, this morning that uh, God said that the clay represented the whole house of Israel. We know that there were God's chosen people. Believers are also God's children through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these verses and this story refers also to us. There's the spinning, there's the making, there's the marring, there's the modifying, are all parts of what happens in the life cycle of the clay. From a useless lump of clay to a very useful vessel, life is the wheel that is spun according uh, to, around to so swiftly by the potter. It is not controlled by chance or by luck. We know that luck does not come into the vocabulary of the believer. Perhaps you listened this week to the great coverage of the new president of the USA, President Joe Biden. You may have listened to the outgoing president, Donald Trump, wishing Biden the best of luck in his new post. I want to say to your friends today, our lives, whenever we are saved, is controlled by God, not by chance and not by luck. It was Job who reminds us in Job chapter 10 and verse 8, Thine eyes have made me and fashioned me together round about, yet thou dost destroy me. Perhaps many that are listening to this message this morning, you've been used in evangelical circles. You've attended gospel meetings and gospel services. And no doubt you will have sung many times that little chorus that we have sung often in this church here, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. And of course that little chorus goes on, Melt me, mould me, break me, fill me, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. The reason why God has saved any of us is that we might serve him, that we might obey him, that we might walk in the light with him. In other words, we are saved to serve. He saves us so that we could be actively engaged in his service here on earth. After I was converted many years ago, there's a verse that I read that is on in the inside of one of my old Bibles. And it just goes like this here, Could a mariner sit idle if he heard the drowning cry? Could a doctor sit in comfort and just let his patients die? Could a fireman sit idle, let men burn and give no hand? How can I sit at ease in Zion with the world around me damned? And so one of the greatest portraits of God and his people in Scripture in our relationship must surely be that of the potter and the clay that Jeremiah uh, um, leaves for us here. I want you to notice that verse 1 tells us the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Isn't it so true that very often we will go to the Word of God because we're looking direction or we're looking confirmation maybe with regard to some path that we ought to take? But the difference here is the word of God came to Jeremiah. Very, very important to have the word of God hid in our hearts, as the psalmist reminds us, that we might not sin against God. God's word came to him. 
John tells us, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And so the word came. And the Lord gave a message to Jeremiah. He was to go down to the shop where the clay pots and the jars are made. And God says to him, there I will cause thee to hear my words. And so the prophet is humble enough to obey the call. He's willing enough to learn and uh, to see what God is teaching him. He's going to be taught from the actions of an illiterate potter. And so he went to hear the word of God. That may challenge all of our hearts again today as to what is God saying to us. Perhaps maybe we think to ourselves, well, why didn't God just speak to Jeremiah where Jeremiah was at? Why did he have to go to the potter's house to hear? After all, one of God's attributes reminds us that God is everywhere. We know that God spoke to Isaiah whenever Isaiah went into the temple. He spoke to the Apostle Paul whenever Paul was on a road. And he reminds Paul as to who Paul is persecuting and that it was hard for Paul to kick against the pricks. But here in Jeremiah's case, we're told he has to go to the potter's house. And so there's this physical location he had to go to to hear the word of God. Matthew Henry, the commentator, he translates this verse, go to the potter's house and observe how he manages his work and there will I cause thee by silent whispers to hear my words. Whenever Elijah was finding himself in a very depressed state, we know that God came to him not through the fire, not through the whirlwind, but in a still, small voice. And so Jeremiah had to walk by the potter's field. And seeing all the pieces of pottery broken and thrown onto the rubbish heap, as it were, as spoke volumes to him. I trust, friends, today that we do not see men as trees walking, but that we see men as souls for whom Christ has died. Here, Jeremiah would never have heard this if he had stayed in his bedroom. He would never have heard it if he hadn't obeyed the word of God. He heard God's word here simply because he was acting in obedience to God. Now, God's message was a message of judgment, but it was also a message of hope. And so as he walked, he thought of the broken cisterns, which could hold no water. Sometimes, like Jeremiah, we need to be in a very specific location for our ears to be open and to be able to hear what God wants to say to us. And I'm not being very mystical today about this. I believe that God makes his plans and his ways very clear to us. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. Perhaps there are times whenever God has to speak to us from a sick bed. Maybe sometimes God speaks to us whenever death enters. Maybe sometimes God speaks to us whenever everything is going well. And I'm sure that I haven't a doubt about it that God must surely be speaking to us even over these last nearly 12 months and the crisis that we all seem to be facing. Some things you will never uh, hear from God until you first obey. Remember, the prophet Samuel reminds us to obey is better than to sacrifice. 
We have before us in this passage of Scripture the Master's design. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah's day, God's people were in a bad situation. They were a nation who had thrown off God, as it were, and I say that reverently, that led aside his ways and his plans. Corruption was widespread. And so in this word that comes to Jeremiah, we're told, Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. I suppose if you were to ask me what my favourite subjects were in school, I would have to be honest and say I hadn't many favourite subjects. But one thing that I used to enjoy, and that was the art and craft class. In the school that I attended, which is a long, long time ago, our art and crafts teacher was a Miss Marshall. And some years ago, at a function here in Cookstown, I met Miss Marshall. I hadn't seen her for many, many years. And she came over to me and she talked and I joked with her and I said to her, I said, you know, Miss Marshall, many a time you kept us so late in the class, we missed the bus home. And she laughed. Because Miss Marshall used to talk about all sorts of things in the class, only art and pottery. And then whenever it would come to 10 minutes to three or so, she would put on like a very cross voice. And she would say to us, she would say, look here, you've wasted the whole class. You've had nothing done in this class. You better get to work. And the bell would ring at a quarter past three, but she wouldn't let us out. But I liked Miss Marshall. She was a good teacher. But one thing that I remember in Miss Marshall's class was, in those early days, was the pottery class. And I think the first thing that we had to make in pottery was a pinch pot. And I remember we got this lump of clay and you pressed your thumbs into it and eventually it was glazed. It was fired in the kiln and then it was glazed. And then a little later on, we made a, like a vase out of a number of pinch pots and we put them all together and again it was fired and was glazed. Amazingly, I still have that vase. Now, I'm talking about a long number of years ago. And on the bottom of that vase, it's a green vase because I am a bit of a hoarder. On the bottom of that vase, it just gives my initials MP 3N. So I was third year in the school. But I liked pottery. I liked seeing the wheel. No, I was no expert at it. And so we see in this story here, the master has a design, a perfect design. But we're told the master's intention was the potter has a singular purpose. He plans to take the clay and produce a good vessel. He wants to make vessels that will reap a profit. He wants those that will be found useful. And he wants those that will be an honour to him. And this is God's intention whenever he saves us. Jesus saves us by his grace. The moment that he saves us, till the moment that he calls us home through death or through his return, Whatever way we exit this world one day, we are a work in progress. The Bible tells us, Be ye holy that bear the vessels of the Lord. Now the potter has ingredients. We're told there was the clay. This represents the house of Israel, dug out of Egypt and brought into Canaan. Like Israel, we've been taken out of the clay pit of darkness. We have been liberated from the bondage of slavery. We have been translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. The clay was dug out of the ground. It was worthless, really, until the potter decides to make something with it. I love that hymn that reminds us in loving kindness, Jesus came, my soul in mercy to reclaim, 
And from the depths of sin and shame, praise God, he lifted us. There was the ingredients, there was also the instruments that the potter was going to use. The potter uses several implements to bring the clay to a place where it is usable. And I want to say, dear friends, today, that if you're a believer, that God has many instruments that he uses in all of our lives. We know that, of course, there's a shovel. This is the tool used to dig the clay from the earth. This is a picture of the Holy Spirit coming to us right where we were in our sin and convicting us. There was a mallet after the clay has been cleansed and processed. It is placed on a table and beaten with a wooden mallet. The potter does this to remove any air bubbles that are trapped in the clay. If he doesn't, the air bubbles will form a pocket that will produce a weak spot. Now, those of you that are from Cookstown and maybe some farther afield, I know that for many, many years, I've always had an interest in antiques. And one thing that I've collected over the years is Victorian glass. Cranberry, some people call it ruby glass, Vaseline glass, amber glass, and maybe other types of glass. And one thing that you will learn, even if you're a novice in glass, and that is if you have a piece of glass and it's perfect, well, it's not Victorian in all probability. Because what you do with Victorian glass, you look for the imperfections, you look for the air bubbles, you look for the weaknesses. And we know that much repro glass is around and has been for many, many years. We know that a lot of glass now comes from Czechoslovakia, from other countries. But I suppose it's still possible to be pretty sure whenever it comes to the old. I suppose especially Jonathan and Samuel, over the years with me, though not in recent years, we have taken enjoyment in going over to the antique fair near Nottingham at Newark. And there, if you've ever been, there's thousands of stalls, people from all over the world. It's the world's biggest international antique fair. And you go there and you'll see antiques and you'll also see repros that are very like antiques. And any of us, of course, could be caught in thinking that we have the real antique whenever maybe it's a repro. And I remember a number of occasions here in the church where people said to me, they said, I'm pretty sure that I saw you or I saw Samuel at a unflogged or bargain hunt on some of those televisions. I don't think I'm doting, but I'm pretty sure that we've seen you. And so I said to a number of the congregation, you're not doting, you're not confused, Yes, you saw us. And one of those occasions was with Gloria Honeyford on one of those uh, events that, again, of bargain hunt or whatever. But I want to say this, dear friend, that there can be the weak spot. And so the potter here, he wants to remove this weak spot. And so he hammers out the clay. Now we find, of course, that this is a picture with the hammering of the trials, the calamities, the chastisement uh, that comes into all of our lives. But remember, God is working out all things together for our good. We don't like the pounding of the mallet. We don't like it. The Apostle Paul was able to say in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. The crucified man has no ambitions of his own. No, he's in the hands of the potter. The crucified man is facing in one direction. He's nailed to the cross. He focuses on Christ. He wants to be faithful to his calling. 
And then the other article that is used, or another instrument, and that is the wheels. Behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. The potter controls the speed of the wheels. They only rotate according to his will. Never forget that God is in control regardless of what we may face in life. God is in control. There's also the potter's hands. While the clay spins around the wheels, it is never out of contact with the potter's hand. He's moulding and he's shaping. What a lovely picture of our Heavenly Father. There are times, perhaps, whenever the potter seems far away. Times whenever our Heavenly Father may seem disinterested in us. Times whenever he seems to be so far removed and so remote from us. And yet he has promised never to leave us or forsake us. I've heard a song before. I don't know all the words of it. That peace, he's still working on me to make me what he wants me to be. What a picture of our Heavenly Father. But I want you to notice, friends, today in verse 4, the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. There's a problem here, a problem with the vessel. Even in the potter's hands, things can still go terribly wrong. The fault is not with the potter, the fault is with the clay. Isn't this the way our lives seem at times? All is going well. We're growing in grace. We seem to have a great zeal and a love for the things of God. Then along comes temptation or trials and we're thrown off balance and we become marred. I wonder today, are you a marred vessel in the hands of the potter? What causes the vessel to be marred? Sometimes maybe it's caused by disappointment. I know of those today, as I'm sure many do, who even once were involved in the work of God, and things maybe didn't work out the way that they anticipated or the way that they planned, and sadly today they have little interest in the things of God. Disappointment set in. Maybe sometimes the vessel is marred through unbelief. The very disciples had to pray, Help thou mine unbelief. Sometimes I reckon the vessel is marred by divided loyalties. May we always remind ourselves, No man can serve two masters. Joshua reminds us whenever the people said, oh, we're going to serve you and we're going to serve idols and all. Joshua had to say to them, but you can't. Choose ye this day whom you're going to serve. Put away those gods. Maybe sometimes the vessel is marred through an unyielding spirit. We're not willing to yield our lives to the hands of of the potter. What about you today? Can you identify with this? Oh, there's the potter's design. He wants to make this vessel a perfect vessel. Is all the tools, all the instruments. God does everything well. There's his disappointments. Sometimes, perhaps, maybe, and even maybe you're listening to this message this Lord's Day morning. There are times maybe whenever we think we're unusable and even unredeemable. Perhaps we've done something for which we feel 
shame and guilt and we think God can no longer use us. Our problems are occasionally of our own making. We can bring problems upon ourselves, upon our families, upon others. Our problems sometimes are our own making. Sometimes our pain may arise from our own stupidity. But when we bring our sin to the Lord, confess it earnestly, nail it to the cross of Christ and surrender it to the power of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, God can take away our sin and shame from us and then mould us again into a vessel that will glorify him. The potter's disappointment. I'll conclude today with the potter's decision. He decided to make another vessel. Surely that tells me something about the patience of the potter. He's our Heavenly Father today. He only wants to give us that which is good, that which is edifying, that which will, that will build us up in the, the faith. We're told he takes the marred vessel. He presses it back into a lump. And he begins again. Begins all over again. As I mentioned at the beginning, our lives are controlled by God. The important thing is that the clay is pliable in his hands. I wonder this morning, many years ago, whenever I was in secular work, I remember well having a sore head. And I went along to the first aider, and that's who she was. She was a first aider. She wasn't a nurse or she wasn't a GP. And I called her by name and I said to her, I said, I have a sore head. Could you give me a couple of Fensic? I don't even know whether you can buy Fensic today or not. I don't know. I remember she stopped and she looked at me and she said to me, it used to be in my day the doctor prescribed to the patient. Now we're having the patient prescribed to the doctor. Now, she was no doctor, but maybe she thought she was more qualified than she was. But I trust today that our lives are Pliable. The process of making the vessel is not always pleasant. We're told the potter doesn't use new clay. He has a vested interest in what happens to the clay. And he gives a very clear message. A message about control. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. We're saved this morning. We are not our own. We've been bought with the precious blood of Christ. There was a message about yielding. The duty of the clay was to yield to the will of the potter. I wonder, can you say today, I am totally yielded to the will of God in my life. Or are there still areas where I've got control? Do I make up all my plans and then go to God and tell God how I think it should be? Or do I step back and say, look, God, you're the potter and I am the clay. In the year 1902, before any of us were born, a 42-year-old woman sat in a prayer meeting one night with a broken heart. She has served the Lord faithfully all her adult life in many different capacities. 
all the time she was dreaming of her heart's desire to take the gospel to Africa as a missionary. When her plans finally seemed to be moving forward, there was a lack of financial support, and so it brought her dream to a standstill. And so heartbroken, she goes to a prayer meeting. No better place she could have gone to. It was a church prayer meeting. She was so annoyed, she was hardly able to focus on what was going on around her. But she was struck by the words of an elderly lady in the prayer meeting who prayed. And the lady prayed this here. She said, Look, God, it really doesn't matter what you do with us, Lord. Just as long as you have your way in our lives. She couldn't get the idea out of her mind. Whenever she went to sleep, again, all she could think about were the words that this elderly woman prayed. It really doesn't matter what you do with us, Lord. Just have your own way in our lives. Later that evening, she began to meditate upon this passage that we're speaking about today. The story of the potter shaping the clay. And so... Adelaide Pollard from that prayer meeting wrote all four verses of that now beloved hymn that we probably have memorized we have sung it so often have thine own way Lord that hymn was published in the year 1907 perhaps you know it so well one of the verses goes have thine own way Lord have thine own way, thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mould me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded and still. Goes on, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Saviour divine. The last verse goes, Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me.
Let's pray. Father, we're so glad this morning that you are the potter and that we are the clay. And we realise, Lord, there's been many times, maybe whenever you've had to break the vessel, you've had to remake us. And I pray, Father, with the words of Adelaide Pollard's hymn here, that we'll be honestly able to say, Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit, till all shall see, Christ only always, living in me. Father, if there's someone listening today, and they're a broken vessel, and perhaps the vessels have been marred through the circumstances of life, I pray that they might place that life again into your hands, knowing that the Lord will perfect that which concerns us. Pray for your blessing to be upon us today. Blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We ask it in your lovely name. Amen.